I want to start my message today by taking us back in time, all the way back in time to last Sunday. I want to do a little recap before I bring us into today's text. You know how TV shows will do this. We'll give a little recap before they dive into the next episode. You know, previously, this season on Lost. So Pastor Veronica and I, if you were here, preached last Sunday in celebration of Reverend Dr. King. We talked about the work of prophetic justice of speaking truth to power. In that sermon, Reverend Veronica drew the connection between the work of Dr. King and the work of Jesus, saying, Dr. King wasn't the only royalty to write the vision of a day when all people would be free. The Prince of Peace, Jesus is his name, read from the Isaiah scroll, the spirit of the Lord is on me because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. <clears throat> this is a well-known scripture certainly well known to this congregation because Pastor Veronica and myself turn to it frequently. It should be well known throughout Christendom because it is the thesis statement for Jesus's ministry. <clears throat> In this scripture, Jesus tells us exactly what he has come to do. And he then proceeds to go and do it to live it out through his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. I want to pick up here because as luck, or perhaps the Holy Spirit would have it, this scripture is one of the lectionary choices for today. I can't make that up. I did not plan that. It was in the lectionary. And where the Holy Spirit leads, we must follow. So today's gospel text is Luke 4, 14 through 21. This text is the start of Jesus's ministry. He has been baptized by John. He has been tested by Satan in the wilderness. And he now begins his public ministry. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus starts his ministry right at home. He starts in Nazareth, where he grew up. And the scripture says that he starts by going to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. And now, in the synagogue at the time, any male could be asked to read the Torah or to give a sermon. It actually isn't all that different from our custom here at Hyde Park Union Church when you get that call from the worship committee asking you to serve as a reader for Sunday. Although imagine if the call was not just to read, but also to give the sermon. Do you think we should try that out sometime? <laughs> so Jesus, he isn't really doing anything that radical here. He's participating in worship the way that perhaps he's done before or at least in a way he has seen others do before. So he reads this powerful section from the prophet Isaiah, as you heard in the quote from last week's sermon. He reads it out to a congregation of people that he knows. Then he rolls up the scroll, he hands it back to the attendant and he sits down. Now here's where things get radical. The scripture says that all eyes remained on him. The congregation is still captivated by his reading. So Jesus looks out at them and he says, today 
this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Imagine what that must have been like to hear. What it must have been like to see this young man, someone you know, read a profound and powerful scripture and then say, it has been fulfilled. That is what caught my attention this week as I sat with these texts. This assertion that scripture can be fulfilled, this belief that God's vision can become reality, not just something in the future, not just something that maybe one day might happen, but no, it can be fulfilled here and now. And Jesus did fulfill the scripture. He proclaimed good news and liberation until his last breath and beyond. Jesus did it then. What about now? What about now? Do we believe that scripture can be fulfilled in this day and age? Do we, as people living in the year 2022, believe that God's vision can become reality? Or perhaps the question, question isn't whether or not it can be, and more a question of how. How does God's vision become reality? Now here is where I turn to the words of the Apostle Paul that we heard Louise read this morning. These two are well-known words. In 1 Corinthians, Paul offers his famous metaphor of the church as the body of Christ. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Jesus fulfilled scripture, fulfilled the vision of God through his ministry. Now, I want to suggest that the church, as the body of Christ, can do the same. Of course, being the body isn't easy. Paul aptly describes the body and how it must function together. The hand cannot just voluntarily take its leave. The ear cannot operate independently. The foot cannot be the entire body on its own. Don't ever let anyone tell you that Paul wasn't funny. This passage is as humorous as it is poignant. Think about it. Paul's words conjure up images of a malformed body, perhaps one that attempts to exist entirely of eyeballs, or one whose members are just constantly trying to pull themselves apart. It's a funny image. Yet it speaks to an experience that many of us have had. Have you ever been part of a team where everyone tries to take the same role? Everyone wants to be the pitcher and no one wants to play the outfield. Everyone wants to be Hamlet and no one wants to be Guildenstern. That's a nerdy example, but trust me, it, it fits. <laughs> it's like a group project. It only works if everyone contributes. And sometimes it doesn't go that well. And raise your hand if you've been part of a horrible group project in your life. Anyone? Okay, yes. <laughs> I will never forget sixth grade social studies. Each group had to build a model of an ancient civilization. I can't for the life of me remember what civilization my group was assigned, but I do remember that no one else in my group did the work. It was a nightmare. And it was the one and only time my parents ever did some of my homework for me. 
They never, they had a policy. We're never going to do your homework for you. But this one time they did. We practically stayed up all night building things out of modeling play. It was horrible. Being the body isn't easy. Everyone has to participate and a variety of roles must be filled. Yet despite the difficulty, it is worth it because being the body offers us a chance for a profound experience of God. Being the body gives us the chance to fulfill scripture, the chance to perform God's work in the world. It is as St. Teresa of Avila said, Christ has no body now, but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. If scripture is to be fulfilled in this day and age, we are the ones to do it. So the question becomes how? How do we be the body? I suggest that it requires three things. First, as already mentioned, it requires us to work together. And it requires that we value the collective good. Now there is a maladaptive understanding of collective good. This metaphor of the body, Paul didn't make it up. It was actually used in antiquity quite frequently, but it was often used to reaffirm hierarchies. The argument went something like this. A servant should stay a servant for the good of the whole. After all, not everyone can be an emperor. The day laborer should accept their low status in order to maintain a peaceful and functioning society. So Paul, when he writes about the body, he is actually reframing this ancient metaphor, asking us to both value the collective good and to honor the least of these. Paul writes, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Paul says to us, it isn't enough to just work together. We must work together with equity and with inclusion. We must work together in a way that honors and listens to those on the margins. This is critical. My friends, we are living in a time that requires us to work together, that requires us to value the collective good, that requires us to listen to those on the margins. The COVID pandemic is one clear example. Our choice to wear a mask, our choice to temporarily limit our activity, that is for the collective good, that is for others. It is for the good of the most vulnerable. It is for the good of our burned out healthcare workers. Climate change is another clear example. We have got to work collectively or the poorest among us will quite literally run out of water. Will quite literally have their homes sink into the ocean. It is already happening. We have to work together. That's what being the body of Christ means, working together for the collective good. This has never been more important. Two, being the body requires each of us to play a role. Every single person I see on this Zoom screen right now has a role. Every single person who hears my voice today or who watches a replay later this week has a role. You have a spiritual gift. I promise you this. God has given each and every one of us unique skills for the body of Christ. 
Do you know what yours is? That's a real question. Take a moment and consider it. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? Paul lists several. Teaching, performing miracles, healing, helping, administrating, speaking in tongues. Now, some of this language may sound a little strange to our ears or outdated. So let me rephrase. There are gifts of public speaking, of leading committees and task forces, of teaching Sunday school and Bible study, of helping set up fellowship events, of feeding the hungry by volunteering at the food pantry, of advocating and protesting for change, of making meals for sick members, of translating and greeting someone in their native language, of taking care of those who are ill or suffering, of singing and worship, of administration, and helping with email listservs. That's a spirit. There are innumerable spiritual gifts. What is yours? Some of you might not know, and that's okay. It takes time to connect with and hone our talents. But again, I promise that you have one. And there are discernment practices that can help us identify our gifts. We can identify our gifts by asking ourselves questions like, what energizes me? What brings me joy? What have other people noticed in me? What comes easily to me? Or conversely, what doesn't come easily, but that I find myself drawn to all the same? The good news is you don't have to figure it out on your own. That's part of my role. That's part of my spiritual gift as a pastor to help walk with people in the discernment process around spiritual gifts. Now, if you do know what yours are, wonderful. Are you using them? And are you using them faithfully in the body of Christ? If the answer is yes, good, keep going. <laughs> if the answer is no, well, let's talk about that. Let's pray about that. Let's exercise that part of the body. Because here's the thing, the church needs you. Yes, you, if you think I'm not talking to you, I am, the church needs you. This church needs you. There is so much good work before us. Hard work, yes, but good work. Work that's going to take every single one of us. I'll say it again, this church needs you. And the church at large needs you. God needs you at work in creation. Being the body requires working together for the collective good and acknowledging and using our gifts. Three, the body of Christ requires diversity. Notice that Paul takes diversity as a given. He doesn't say the body of Christ should be diverse or diversity is something to work toward. No, diversity is at square one. Paul starts with diversity in mind. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks. We are part of a whole, part of this unity of body. But that doesn't mean that we give up our identities. Too often being part of a group requires that we conform to the group. And too often being part of a church requires that one conform to a specific way of being. That's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ does not ask us to leave part of ourselves at the door. In fact, doing so would harm the body. Remember, the body isn't well served by a foot that is pressured to be more like a hand. No, 
The body is made all the more beautiful by our different identities. Being the body, it requires working together for the collective good. It requires that we acknowledge and use our gifts and it requires diversity. Now, if we do this, if we fulfill these three parts, if we truly inhabit the body of Christ, I believe that scripture will be fulfilled. I believe that. I believe that because Jesus says in John 12, 14, very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these. Jesus said to his followers and to us today, you can do what it is that I am doing. I empower you to follow and continue my ministry. I believe that we can fulfill scripture because I have seen the body of Christ at work. I have seen with my own eyes what it looks like when we fully inhabit our calling. So what if we allowed this knowledge to change our relationship to scripture? What if when we hear this call from Isaiah to proclaim good news to the poor and recovery of sight to the blind, we said to ourselves, we are going to fulfill that. What if when we read of Jesus feeding the 5,000, we say, yes, we're going to do that too. What if when we read of God's love for all her creation, we say, yes, we're going to love like that kind of love. We are the body of Christ. We have within this body the power to bring God's vision to reality. So let us go and do it. Amen.